Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Uiki Beng uh, of Penang Institute. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. This is, I think, our record crowd. Um, this is by way of telling, telling Claire how much we appreciate her work. Um, now, now, usually I'll start by reading a bio, bio data of, of our speaker. I don't think I'll do that today. I think you all know who she is and what she's done. Uh, suffice it to say that when, well, she is our favorite investigative journalist, isn't she? <laughs> Um, and for, for years and years, uh, her work was a thorn in the side of the Taib Mahmud regime in Sarawak, and still is, I think. Uh, but that thorn in the side of, of Taib became a spear in the heart of the BN government in the end, when her work went into, the, into investigating the, the extent, the international extent of the 1MDB scandal. And that, I'm sure you all agree, helped to bring down the, uh, the, the, uh, the Barisan National Government in May this year. Uh, so I won't, you're all here to listen to her, so I won't, I won't uh, say any more except to welcome her very, very warmly to Penang. This is, by the way, her first time in Penang. So, So, so it's up to you to convince her to come back again, not for work, but to, just to enjoy Penang. Yes. Claire, please, the floor is yours. Wow, thank you so much. I, I have had such a fantastic welcome here in Penang. What lovely people you all are. And thank you all for coming here. Um, and, and I feel so badly about all of you standing at the back. I mean, it's great there's so many people. I was going to suggest maybe a bit of Sarawak style long hot house. You could just sit down and cross your legs. <laughs> then I won't feel so bad. Um, Thank you also, you know, Data Oi and, and, and everyone here at the Penang Institute for inviting me to such a wonderful venue to, to speak to all of you. And, and thank you to uh, Gareth and his team from uh, Jarrett Badaya Books and, and also to my wonderful hosts who've been looking after me ever since I arrived. Thank you, Kim Bong and, and Jeffrey Cheer. Thank you so much, all of you, for your wonderful welcome. Um, and, and, and actually, I, I, you know, I, I've heard about your fantastic food. I have some friends in London who are from Penang. So um, I, I wasn't surprised, but I have had a wonderful culinary experience in the last few hours. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I very much look forward to taking up the many offers I've had to come back. Um, but, um, you know, the moment I put my feet on the ground here in Penang, I felt I was back on the, I was back on the news hounding role. Um, you know, I, obviously I'm fascinated. This is one of the epicenters of the story of 1MDB. This is the home of Joe Tate Lowe. <laughs> so, um, I was so interested, you know, I, I've been asking everybody, now I've heard this, I've heard that, you know, can you cooperate? Um, and people have been coming, I mean, this has been one of my experiences with uh, being a sleuth um, on the 1MDB story, is I have throughout this benefited from information, support from, from Team Malaysia, really. So many people have, have made this uh, whole enterprise possible um, by becoming my 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 empire, my publishing empire of uh, volunteers and informants um, who turned a one-woman blog into a movement, and that was because of all of you. Uh, and one of the interesting tip-offs I had um, earlier today was from someone who came up and told me, you know, Jolo was not that clever. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> and at, in fact, he was a really poor student. Um, and we had a hard time teaching him English when he was a little boy. And um, actually, I don't blame anyone for finding that difficult. But uh, this actually confirmed a suspicion that I have long had. Because, you know, who steals billions of dollars and then goes around making a complete exhibition of himself worldwide? You know, everywhere. 
flaunting his cash. You know, there wasn't a, you know, there wasn't a nightclub he didn't go into. There wasn't a, you know, a casino where he wasn't creating record spending. Um, you know, fl flourishing around. You know, making all these friends with these famous stars. You know, when I first started looking into one MDB, you know, you would uh, you would open up the Hollywood, um, you know, uh, gossip rags, and they kept talking about billionaire, you know, Malaysian businessman Joe Lowe. Uh, you know, he's 26. So, um, you know, really, I, I would, you know, if there's any other young, aspiring um, mega thief here in the room or that you know of in Penang, <laughs> I, I would suggest play it cool, you know? Hide your money like others do under a stone. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, really don't tip off people like me. Uh, <laughs> um, because really that was how I started on the 1MDB story. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that this story of 1MDB will, will eventually, and, and the way I, I was involved and other journalists got onto this story, I hope that will in, encourage young, young Malaysians, young, young kids from Penang to consider uh, journalism as, as a career possibility for themselves. It's, it's a very, very important uh, service to the community that they would be doing um, if they went into journalism with the right, um, you know, the, the right intentions, which is to inform the people so that the people can make the right decisions when they come to that very, very important duty that they have to perform of choosing who is the right person to lead the country. And if you have a situation where an oppressive government has started to intimidate those journalists so they feel they can't actually speak information and they can't tell the truth, and in fact they're forced to put out propaganda for the people who are in control, that's how you end up with a corrupt government in power for 60 years. So now you've managed to throw off that situation that you were living under, um, you need to encourage uh, young budding journalists um, to help keep, keep you guarded against um, untruths. Um, and um, how, how does a journalist operate well, when, they're, when they're doing what I do, which is go around trying to sniff out stories um, and, and, and then dig um, and, you know, and, and, and ask questions? What they do is they, they look at things that don't add up to begin with, usually. I mean, sometimes you get a story comes out of the blue, someone taps you on the shoulder and, wow, you've got a fantastic story. Um, but usually, usually um, you know, you're looking for something you, you, or you spot something that doesn't quite add up. And um, when I was uh, actually uh, on holiday um, at the end of 2013, um, the Christmas break, I was with my family, and we were in Switzerland, um, and um, somebody from Malaysia sent me an email, um, uh, which was about The Wolf of Wall Street, the new movie that everyone was, you know, it was being advertised everywhere, it was about to be in all the cinemas, it was quite a contentious movie, we all knew it was a mega blockbuster movie that had cost a hundred million dollars to make. Um, and, and this person wrote and they said, hey, do you know who the producer of this movie is? Oh, no, it was the son of Rosma Mansell, the, the wife of Najib Razak. And I, well, that was odd, and, and, and even odder actually was the was the was the fact that this proud mother was um, trying to get uh, Malaysian schools to show the movie to school kids. Um, <laughs> I, I don't recommend the movie myself; it's it's too uh, naughty for me. Um, so um, you know, this was all very odd, wasn't it? Um, and and what it really left one wondering, you know, very much about the moral um, sort of you know, compass of, of the family. Um, and, and also just, you know, how, how come this, this young man who was just in his 30s um, was suddenly launching this movie? And, and I started to, uh, you know, kind of drift away. You know how, you know, uh, sometimes you drift away from what you should be doing, which is talking to your family and, and you go back onto the internet. And I started to Google this, this phenomenon. And, and very soon, I, I, was, I was unraveling the story of, of Riz Aziz. Who was he? He was a, a young man and he had had a few years in a junior position in a London bank. And then he kind of lost that position in 2008. Um, there was nothing wrong with that. But there was nothing that told me, A, that he knew f a fig about making a movie, um, 
or B, that he had any money to invest. And, and I could see from uh, all the articles that I was reading that he was talking about having skin in the game. Now, that means money in the picture. Um, and, and so why was it that um, this guy had been presumably chosen by someone? He said that the money was coming in from, from Asian investors. So why would someone who is obviously a very rich, successful Asian investor uh, choose this young man who's never made movies, who's uh, you know un untried, untested, unsuccessful? <laughs> why would they choose him to invest a million, hundred million to make a, a movie about something? Um, so none of his kind of you know. It, it, so I just kept looking at all this, um, and, and as I went online, and, and of course, you know, this is the wonderful world we live in. I, I'm quite old, um, and when I started off as a journalist, we didn't have this wonderful thing called the internet, and I was quite slow to get onto it, but hey, once I, once I discovered its potential, um, you know, I, I, I was addicted. Um, and um, I started to realize, um, you know, with a shiver that went down my spine, that every time I turned up photographs or, you know, stories about launch events in Hollywood, next to Reza would be one young man, uh, that chubby face that we all already knew. We already knew this guy from the, the gossip columns as the uh, hedonistic, ostentatious, mystery billionaire Joe Lowe from Penang. <laughs> um, and, and, and I just thought... <laughs> I just thought, oh my goodness, this stinks. <laughs> really, you know, something is wrong here. Because what did we all know about Joe Lowe, apart from the fact that he was always spending record amounts of money, um, you know, in hotspots? We knew that he was believed to be very close to the Prime Minister, and in particular, the key advisor um, on this development fund, uh, one MDB. And we already knew by the end of 2013 that there was a lot of concern and criticism about this, this fund because um, it was unusual, you know, it was, the point of it was very unclear. Why borrow money? You know, this wasn't a sovereign wealth fund. It was a, it was kind of Najib playing Mr. Enterprise. I'm going to show businessmen how to do it. I'm going to borrow billions of dollars and I'm going to invest it and apparently this is all going to go well and my investments are going to kind of do things for Malaysia. It's going to do development stuff for Malaysia. Um, and it was all rather unconvincing. Uh, critics were very suspicious um, and already we knew that the money had been borrowed at very high interest rates and most particularly by the end of 2013, we knew that uh, the accounts weren't being properly um, submitted. Um, there were, you know, concerns that so much of this money had disappeared. The partners that um, One MDB were working with, particularly this outfit Petra Saudi, they weren't sort of proper, you know, blue chip. Is that the word people use? They weren't blue chip partners. Nobody had heard of these guys. They were more young tearaways, rumoured to be friendly with the Joe Low and the Reza Razi crowd. So, so there I am thinking. We have a mystery fund, which appears to have lost a great deal of public money, uh, run by the Prime Minister together with this guy called Joe Lowe. And now, with all that money missing, we, we have a mystery situation in Hollywood where suddenly the son of the Prime Minister and apparently Joe Lowe's great friend, uh, Reza Aziz, or the stepson, of course, um, is, is spending mysterious millions. And, um, you know, I thought maybe there might be a connection. <laughs> um, and um, so I did what journalists are then supposed to do. I asked, is there a connection? Um, is there a connection between the missing money um, and, and, the, and the money that's turning up in the, in the pockets of um, this best friend of Joe Lowe? And um, I received an answer in, in the form of very aggressive legal letters. Um, from uh, from from uh, uh, Jolo and from Reza Aziz's uh, company, Red Granite Pictures, um, and, and I thought that was an unsatisfactory way to respond to me. To say that I was implying things that I'd very carefully taken 
taking care not to quite directly imply. Um, you know, you have to be very careful with your words when you're just answer, asking questions. So they, they, they immediately said, you're implying that the money was stolen from 1MDB. I'd been careful, I'd been more careful. Um, and they immediately told me that I had to apologize, you know, that I would be destroyed, I would be ruined, um, I had to uh, retract everything. Um, so of course I thought, oh, I've upset them then, good. Um, Meanwhile, um, another, you know, I, I have to say this book tells you all this. I, I shouldn't really be going on too much because, you know, you won't want to buy it. <laughs> um, but um, um, I, I do tell this story really from, this is through my eyes, you know, uh, and, and um, as a journalist, and, and there will be better histories of, of 1MDB, without a doubt, but I wanted to communicate to you how it felt to be the journalist that, that gets into the story. Um, and um, so the next thing that happens in these situations, if, if there's something in it, um, is people start to get in touch. And by this very early stage, you know, even before Christmas was over, um, I'd started to get some interesting emails anonymously in my letterbox. Um, Claire, hey, like the story. Um, did you know that Reza has a really fancy Beverly Hills mansion? Well, I didn't. Um, and this, this was even more interesting than the movie because it's one thing to be able to pretend that an anonymous uh, investor was willing to invest in a business. It's quite another thing to persuade everybody that he was kind enough to buy you a mansion, um, the most expensive mansion you can buy. So I hopped over to Hollywood before, uh, before January had got going, really, um, and found myself in a very hot, uh, you know, Beverly Hills, wandering around until I'd found that, um, that mansion. And it was a very big, expensive house. Um, and I, I tell you a few of the tricks of how I managed to, how I managed to get into the house, which it, it actually prompted, it actually prompted another letter from uh, the frightening lawyers, um, who accused. It was it was a house that had been bought already, had been renovated. I I got chatting to the gardener next door um, in, as part of this. I, I believe in getting down on the ground, and the gardener explained to me that this foreign guy had come and bought the house, and then he'd sold it to another foreign guy that was Reza, who, who'd bought the house, all done up, and then pulled it down again to build again. And so I, you know, so I worked out that the money was being splashed. It was, a, I think, a $30 million house, and it was being pulled down and rebuilt. Um, and so um, um, I managed to break into the house with a cameraman, actually, and we, there was a lunch break going on, and as it was a building site, it wasn't too hard. Um, and then later I got a, I got a very interesting letter um, from the lawyer saying um, that uh, it was disgraceful of me to write an article splashing across Malaysia, exclusive inside pictures of Reza's new Hollywood mansion, which got very good hits in Malaysia, lots and lots of hits on my blog. Um, uh, it was disgraceful to, to lie and say that this was Reza's mansion. And, and what's more, it was disgraceful to trespass on his client's property. Don't you love lawyers? <laughs> so, sorry, excuse, excuse me, I, only certain lawyers are right, those sorts of <laughs> um, But But anyway, you know, so, so I, I realized that I was dealing with some very insincere people who were trying to intimidate me, and anyone who knows me knows that um, if anyone tries to start bullying me, my, I'm, yeah, I get mulish, um, and I knew I was onto a big story by the time I left uh, Beverly Hills uh, that January. And for the next uh, few months, I was, uh, I, I just was, I had this story on the boil. I was doing the other stuff, and, and I'll talk to you a bit about what I was actually mainly doing at that time still, which was looking at the Sarawak issue. Um, but, um, you know, I was, I was fascinated now by what I, I realized was a, a really big story. I mean, this was a global story. Um, you know, you had this guy, Joe Lowe, who was splashing money around all the really, you know, um, New York, he had mansions there. You know, these, this, this was a story that would, would, would interest everybody. Um, I, I didn't really quite understand how big it was, perhaps to begin with, but I could smell it. And um, so I was doing stuff. I, 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 I spotted by going online that um, Joe Lowe had been involved in um, buying out a major hotel chain for a billion dollars, um, or he had attempted to. He'd put in a bid in um, uh, mid-2011 um, in London, the Claridge's hotel chain. Um, and, of course, um, 
by, by this time, uh, Joe Lowe was putting out uh, press statements through his, uh, his fancy PR firm that was looking after him, um, and they were putting out statements saying that it was all nonsense to say that Joe Lowe had been involved in as an advisor uh, to one MDB beyond the very early days setting it up, and that beyond May 2009, really uh, before it even became called one MDB, uh, Joe Lowe was no longer doing anything, had nothing to do with the fund. So when I went online and could see that there was a court judgment um, uh, in the London High Court, written by a respected judge, who laid out that his finding was that Joe Lowe had been involved in that billion dollar bid with the assistance of money from 1MDB and in partnership with a, um, a company that we all knew of by then, which was ABAR, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu Dhabi, um, which was of course the second partner of 1MDB, um, I, I realized that Joe had been um, lying. Um, so I, I, I asked why Joe Lowe had been lying um, it was one of those questions, you know. Um, and, um, and, and I kept on knocking away at these sorts of things um, and wondering why, why lie? Why lie? Um, and it was around that time that I, I became aware through various inquiries uh, that there was, there was big information out about this company. Um, that somebody had been knocking on the doors of various opposition figures um, to say that they had major data on 1MDB. Um, no one was quite sure, and in fact, the people that had been approached were, were very skeptical. They, 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 they didn't uh, think that this was likely to be genuine information. They thought it might be a trap. They thought it might be a fraud, particularly as there was a, there was a request for money uh, for this information. Well, I always like to look and find out. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't leave things um, on, on any stone unturned. So um, I begged the person who had the, the, the details of how, you know, did he, could he show me anything? He said, yes. And he, he, he said, actually, you know, I've been, I've been given a, um, a document. He said, it doesn't make sense to me. I said, well, have a look at it. He said, yeah, it's on my mobile phone, actually, modern technology. So I, I, I was able to see it there. He sent it to me, you know, sitting next to him. He sent it to me, you know, I opened it up on my, my mobile phone. And immediately, because I'd been looking at this story for so long, immediately I could see that it was extremely interesting. I could recognize that it, this cryptic note was absolutely the, the, the information tallied with all my research, all the things I'd been finding out about 1MDB. And, I, and you know, I could see that it was so detailed that, you know, no one except someone like me who'd been researching it would have necessarily have believed it, which made me feel it wouldn't be a fraud. You know, we've all seen those Nigerian letters, you know, they're fairly, you know, they, <laughs> you know, then they, they make it easy for you to understand why it is that you should give their grandmother 300 pounds. Um, this didn't make it easy. So I thought, well, you know, I said, how do I get in touch with this guy? And he said, well, he's a, he's a guy in Thai, ring this Thai number. So to cut a very long story short, and it's all in my very long book, now you're perhaps beginning to understand why it's a thick book. Um, I ended up in Thailand shortly after that. Um, and I'm allowed to say who my source was, because obviously um, you know about the adventures we went through and the pushback. And, and, and of course, uh, my source was Xavier Justo, who had worked in Petra Saudi. That was the company that had gone into the first uh, joint venture, so-called, with 1MDB. Um, and he had been one of the senior executives. Um, and of course, he had acquired the database when he fell out with his former colleagues, who he, um, he wasn't actually involved in any of this, this stuff to do with um, the deal with uh, 1MDB. And, and he, he found that his, uh, his once friends had suddenly become very obnoxious. They'd suddenly become incredibly rich and were behaving like real real dicks. Uh, <laughs> and he discovered he couldn't stand them anymore, he couldn't work with them anymore, he didn't understand why they were all getting drunk and taking substances and, you know, hiring people you shouldn't hire and all sorts of things like that. And, and so he'd left the company. But he'd felt threatened. They had, um, they had done some very bad things to him. They'd owed him a lot of money still. He'd paid out a lot of money. They hadn't paid it back. And so he, in, he took an insurance, which was to ask the... Um, the IT guy who was in the company, if he could have a copy of the database um, of the company. 
and when he had gone away um, and you know he'd set himself up in Thailand with his beautiful young wife that they decided to go and live in Asia um, and uh, they were opening a rest house and they were going to just retire and forget about the awful experience they'd had um, he started to read through the documents and, and started to realize what was behind um, this extraordinary deal. Now, again, you know, again, I'm telling people who followed this story, but you know that Petrosadi was the, was the company from nowhere. It had a great sort of figurehead, which was this seventh son of the then king of Saudi Arabia. And do you remember at that time, uh, the Malaysian government, BN, they, everything had to be uh, Middle Eastern, didn't it? Everything that was Middle Eastern was just great. You know, you just, you know, Arab money. They went on and on about Arab inward investment. And, you know, this was supposed to be, you know, royal Arab inward investment. Okay. So um, what Xavier had found out was that there'd been diddly squat uh, mid inward investment, there'd just been outward mega flow from Malaysia, Malaysia's money. We all know that what had actually happened was uh, that um, uh, this was just a smokescreen with a, you know, using this company, which was a, a pretend company, a shell company. I'd already realized that because I'd, I'd done some basic research on Petra Saudi. I realized it had only been recently set up. I realized that it had one of those um, websites that, you know, just, you know, wasn't a real company. It was a pretend, you know, all sorts of bought pictures and everything. And in fact, they had another shell company with exactly the same, uh, a different name, but the same kind of, the same website, the same pictures and the same, you know, P, you know, kind of the whole, um, you know, story, the, you know, the, 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 the company story was exactly the same. They hadn't even bothered to change it. So, um, and, and very little money, you know, was, was in the company, um, you know, before, you know, before this uh, deal, uh, this joint venture with Petrus, with, with 1MDB. Um, so, so, what had Xavier found out? Um, you know, we, we went up and he, he let me see he had this massive database, which was all the emails, all the documents that had, that had gone uh, between the various members of Petra Saudi and 1MDB. Uh, it was their mail uh, between um, the, key, the key years of that, of, of that joint venture, just, just Petra Saudi's data, so uh, from 2009 to 2011. Um, and, and he was flicking through, opening up the documents, and, um, and I remember, again, an another of those uh, moments where you're, you, know, you can feel the tingles going to the end of your fingers and toes, and, and your hair goes like this, and, and I, I said, oh, that figure I just saw, you closed it, but can you open it again? Because I think I saw, uh, it must have been 700,000 pounds, but it looked like there were just so many extra noughts. Was that 700 million dollars I saw? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, we, we, we had a long time trying to find it. He said, that was the, um, that was the amount of money out of the first billion dollar investment from 1MDB that went into that firm called Goodstar that Joe Lowe owned. And I said, Joe Lowe owned a company that took $700 million out of the first billion from 1MDB. And that was the moment I knew I had a huge story. Um, it took me months before I managed to part um, uh, Justo from his data. Um, and that story is in the book. <laughs> um, but I have to... I have to race on, <laughs> um, and um, I, where should I race on to? Probably to me coming back to London um, with the data finally uh, in late January of 2015. Um, and I, well, I, I had the data, we hadn't completely opened it, but uh, Savio had kindly given me his top 100 documents. And I sat down in that plane, and I, I was so pleased I had a spare seat next to me so I could, curl up and open this up and I was so tired but you know once I started going through these documents you know all my tiredness fell away as I went through I could see what had happened and I was so anxious could I prove from these documents that Goodstar was owned by Joe Lowe, you know, and, and, you know, there was so much information and everything was falling into place and, you know, I was thinking, oh, I can't prove, I can't prove that it's uh, Joe Lowe that owns the firm. And, um, and then I got to the last document and, and we're kind of seeing dawn over Heathrow and, um, and the last document was a contract. It was a contract between Goodstar 
um, and Tariq Abade, who was the other director of Petra Saudi. Um, for services renders, it was a management fee, I think. No, it was a, it was yeah, it was it was it was a commission. It was a commission for, for the job for the for the uh, for the deal. Um, Eighty million dollars paid by Goodstar to Tariq Abade, and acting for Goodstar was a investment manager um, called Seat Lee Lin, and I knew that Seat Lee Lin worked for Joe Low. I had them. Um, obviously, I was going to get much more comprehensive uh, proof than that, but this was enough. I had the story, um, you know, that, that, that Joe Lowe was involved in this company, clearly. Um, and, and we touched the ground, and, I, and, and um, you know, and I came out of the airport, and, and I remember thinking, you know, I know this is a 2009 document, and, and this is 2015. I wonder if that phone number, that 65 Singapore phone number that's on the document, I wonder if it still works. It might just be worth trying. <laughs> <laughs> so I rang up, you know, ring, 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 nothing. I thought, well, you know, you always try, you know. So I kind of forget about it, and I'm, I've got my bags, and, I, and then suddenly, ring, ring. I said, oh, it's the number, you know, and, you know, and I said, oh, what am I going to say, you know, and I, I, I pick it out and say, hello, who are you, who is ringing me? So I said, it, was that, was that, is that Seat Lee Lim? Said, yes, who's this? So I thought, ah, oh, I said, well, my name is Claire Rucastle. I work for a, a news organization called Sarawak Report, and I would like to know um, if you can tell me about uh, the company uh, Good Star Limited, which took seven hundred million dollars from the first one MD. <laughs> and there was, I could feel the horror radiating <laughs> across the ether at me, and there was this little voice just went, "I don't know what you're talking about." Jing, <laughs> and that phone went dead forevermore. <laughs> I think he ran out and threw it into the Singapore River. So again, I knew, I knew I was onto something then. Um, I, was, I, was on the pre I was the predator by then. Um, so I, 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 but I knew I had a massive story that I wouldn't be able to um, handle on my own. Uh, much as I would have loved to have been the only person to write about it, I knew that to, to, I was dealing with a powerful government um, and uh, very wealthy sets of individuals um, and that this was going to be a very tough call. Uh, you know, they would do everything they could to silence this story um, and I would need to be canny about how I was going to get it out. Um, so the first thing I did was uh, contact... Um, Newspaper, you know, uh, colleagues of mine, people I'd worked with over the years. Um, in fact, I, um, I picked up the phone to the Sunday Times and um, immediately they were very interested. And, and one of the things I've missed out, um, which is in the book, and you can read about it, was that I'd already been working with your own, your very own champion hero of a news publication, The Edge. Um, and they, they already had also a copy of the, of the, of the disc. But, but the problem for them was that they were sitting here trying to run a business in Malaysia. Um, and they knew, they knew they were going to be very limited in what they were going to be able to publish on this story. And they, they had already said to me, you know, Claire, we want to avoid this being about um, the Prime Minister. We, want a, we, don't want to, we don't want to go anywhere near the politics of this. We are a business newspaper, and we're going to stick to the business issues in this and, and the question marks over the fund. Uh, and, you know, we can't go ahead with this deal, Claire, unless you will pledge to behave very well um, and not talk about the other things. Um, so I pledged, um, uh, but uh, you know I couldn't not I couldn't not go ahead, and I think they knew that I would have to tell the story here. You know, um, I think they had a, a difficult time with me because um, I went around like a bull in a china shop. You know, I just went with the story. I I attacked Najib on the first sentence, um, as he deserved to be attacked and criticised. Um, but um, I, um, you know, so, so we were basically already working a double thing. I mean, I, I've worked in this way with brave Malaysian journalists who've done wonderful stories, um, 
in this capacity. I mean, that was my semi-invited role into the territory. They could not write these stories. Based in Britain, I could. So um, I needed the protection of the Sunday Times, um, or some, I, I went to other newspapers, as you well know, later in the, later in the story as I got more information. I, I didn't want to stick with just one paper. I thought, you know, let's really, let's have it all coming. You know, let's get the international media talking about Najib. Um, so, um, uh, so they got to work on the story. And meanwhile, um, I knew I had to do something else. I had to alert the regulators. Of around the world. I, I knew a lot of money had gone into uh, the United Kingdom. I knew that a British bank had been involved, or the Queen's Bank. Coots was the recipient of the 700 million. And I knew that, uh, you know, obviously that a lot of money had gone sloshing into movies and mansions um, and artwork and all sorts of other things that we'd been turning up in the United States. So I, I got on to an outfit I'd heard about um, a, a wonderful development, I think, uh, for us globally. The, 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 um, the DOJ initiative that was started under the Obama administration called the Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Unit. What a brilliant name. And, and it, it, it had been started in recognition of, of the fact that, that this, you know, this, this whole phenomenon of countries being ripped off by greedy, corrupt kleptocrats, places like Malaysia, poor, vulnerable people like the people of East Malaysia who were rich in resources and so deprived, who were being ripped off by their greedy, irresponsible, trust-breaking uh, governments. You know, all that money was being allowed by this evolution of our finance systems to allow this offshore, this offshore hiding system where, where they could push their money secretly through and then make it look clean and nice again. Uh, coming out in, in, in our economies in the developed world. Um, and, and, and this unit and the Obama government had begun to realize how this was bad for everyone. It was bad for us in the, you know, the recipient countries, just, well, not nearly as bad as it was for the people losing the cash. But uh, they realized it was bringing corruption. It was bringing, it was creating powerful people who were criminal who could start to wield influence in our societies, um, to influence um, and pressure politicians and political parties into things that were not good for society. And, and so they started, they were looking for a case. I was lucky, uh, I was lucky that they were looking for a case um, to, to really get to grips with, uh, to, to I think show up this problem and to start clamping down on kleptocrats. And I rang them up. Um, and I said, um, you know, I've, I've, I think I may have a case for you. Might you be interested? I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, um, uh, you know, what sort of sums you're going to be dealing with. I know you're United States and it's the FBI. I said, is 700 million enough for a theft? To <laughs> <laughs> and they said, yeah, ma'am, that will do. No, that's big enough. <laughs> um, so they said, I tell you what, once you've got, and this was interesting, it showed me the way absolutely I knew the balance between public pressure, the media, and the governance, the regulators. They said, after that, after that story comes out in that big newspaper you talked about over there in London, we'll get back in touch with you then. And that's what happened. We got the story out, and of course it was like an, a, a bomb here in Malaysia. You know, the Sunday Times and Sarawak Report um, had accused uh, the Najib government of this outrageous theft. Um, and I had great fun, uh, you know, showing all the shenanigans of Joe Lowe. And, you know, I, I, I went to town talking about, you know, his, his in extravagance, his yacht, his mansions, his thoroughly embarrassing engagement extravaganzas, which he stupidly put up online so you could see how he'd hired orchestras to, to, to propose to this woman who turned him down. So we had all, all of that fun. Um, and then I got the call. I was on a train, actually. It was a very difficult call to take. Um, but I got the call from the FBI. They were going to look into this, and they'd like to come and see me. So um, I, got, I got debriefed by the FBI, which is an alarming thing to be done. <laughs> but, and it was all very formal. 
Um, and then I gave them the information. They didn't talk to me for months. I had no idea what they were doing. I just let them get on with it. Um, and I got on with my job, which was the glorious uh, unfolding now that we'd set the cat amongst the pigeons of the 1MDB investigation. Um, what what uh, this first story did was put Najib on a back foot. He really wasn't expecting, you know, the nuts and bolts and the figures to come out. And, and, and soon I was getting right into the rest of the data, which took some time to open. Um, and um, what, what happened was that, uh, you know, he reckoned he could kind of breeze this out. And he, um, he, he, he announced that, uh, you know, of course, he was just uh, had a very distant role in 1MDB. He was just, a, you know, chairman of the advisory council. He wasn't, wasn't really very knowledgeable about, you know, the, you know, actually the finances. But, um, you know, uh, he, he, would, uh, he would launch some investigations. And if there was any wrongdoing, he told the Sunday Times, you know, uh, you know that th this would be punished. Uh, of course, we later found out that he's the only shareholder of 1MDB, the only signatory, and every single penny that was spent he knew about and signed it off but uh, he reckoned he could keep lying about this um, and what it did was um, it allowed you know this two-track Malaysia to start two-tracking on the one hand you've got a lying lot of thieves <laughs> running things and on the other hand you've got a diligent and really rather effective set of institutions and those four task forces went about their job very diligently and very effectively and soon started digging out very damaging information as you well know about the money that was leaving 1MDB um, and um, coming round into all sorts of other places um, and um, I started to get leaks because as soon as Najib and his crew realized that um, that this was happening they started to push back they started clearly to try and cover up and um, before we knew where we were um, you know this this was all going into reverse and those are the sorts of situations where you find you're getting leaks because people were realizing that you know this wasn't going to get out unless the newspapers got hold of it kind of reminds me of Trump's Washington today. You know, there's the secrets start pouring out and, and Malaysia's deep state really got going for me. Um, and I started to get, hmm, maybe I should start coming to a stop, that's probably an indication. I started to get some amazing leaks, as, as, as possibly people following Sarawak Report will know. Um, you know, I, I, I got the information about the BSI Bank and how that money had, uh, that we were all told a great amount of profit had been made out of the Petro Saudi deal. And, you know, this had all been put, a, a billion dollars was sitting there in the BSI Bank in uh, Singapore, this brazen sky fund that belonged to 1MDB. And we were all being told that, that you know, this was all, you know, this was all genuine money. That, that was owned by the company. And of course, I started to get leaked letters from the Singapore Monetary Authorities spelling out that it was a lie. There was no money. They were just, uh, you know, they were just promissory notes. They meant nothing. Units, as they eventually chose to call them. So I had that story. I, I had many other stories. I started to get details on Joe Lowe's bank accounts in Singapore, um, in the same BSI bank, and I started to realize that, um, you know, he also had a good star bank account there as well as in that Swiss bank account that had taken the original money, and that the Swiss bank account that in Coots had transferred over half a billion dollars into the Joe Lowe good star account in in BSI Singapore, and, and yet still there's Joe Lowe saying he doesn't own Goodstar. Um, and then of course, you know, so I was just, I was just having a marvelous time, you know, there was a story after story I, I, I was getting, um, until of course I got this through my sources that I had been working with. Um, I got this amazing piece of information that, um, that, that uh, 681 million dollars had gone in um, into the Prime Minister's personal bank account in KL uh, just before the calling of GE 13, and that this was something that had been investigated by the 1MDB task forces. So ergo, two and two, it was suspected to be 1MDB money that had gone into the Prime Minister's account. And, and actually, you know, looking at it, um, and, and again, I was working, you know, with, with many other better brains than mine, but who couldn't 
talk, and I, I remember actually the, one of the key editors of the, of the Edge saying, you know, Claire, I don't think that this was um, Petra Saudi from the Petra Saudi uh, uh, you know, phase of 1MDB. I think it's a bit later. Look at, how th look at how the times go. By that time, the joint venture partner was this mysterious Abar, this, this uh, Abu Dhabi fund. And um, just before uh, this money came in, actually two days before the money had come in, um, Goldman Sachs, who'd been raising all these bonds for 1MDB, more massive borrowing, you know, three and a half billion sort of supposed energy bonds that had been uh, raised in 2012, um, and then 2013, this, um, this March 2013 supposed structural, you know, I, I, what do they call it, um, strategic partnership um, bond with Abu Dhabi. And, and Najib had rushed out and raised through Goldman Sachs, paying the most enormous, ludicrous um, commission to the bank, which again left you wondering why. Um, and they had raised $3 billion, and two days after Goldman Sachs had announced that raising of the money, up pops $681 million in Najib's account. So on that occasion, I knew I had another humdinger of a story, and I rang up uh, some contacts I had made at the Wall Street Journal. I said, will you be interested in this? I've got everything here on a plate. And, uh, you know, they, they were interested, and, 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 you know, I showed them the documents, and we ran that story. And, um, you know, that was really, you know, as you well know, when this, this whole story, this whole saga went into mega charge, it became a massive national crisis in Malaysia. Um, and uh, really, from then, I, I think I became public enemy number one. <laughs> Um, I, um, you know, looking back, I, 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 I saw uh, texts from some of these conspirators, some of the people involved, and, and one text really rang in my mind. Um, it was written in French, but translated it said, she is the cause of all our problems. She must be discredited. And that's, of course, what they then tried to do. They went, uh, and you followed some of that. They attacked me in every possible way. They commissioned huge sums of money uh, to set up blogging exercises, false stories. Um, you know, they, 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 they laid charges against me for uh, passing false news. Um, as you well know, they, they uh, banned me for the country. They, they um, brought out an Interpol arrest warrant against me. And of course, in the, and of course they, they arrested Xavier Justo. That was all orchestrated. They made him um, confess, you know, um, on the pain of being put in, in a disgusting, awful cell in a Thai jail for 10 years. They said, we'll let you out if you sign this confession and say that Claire Rucastle is a, um, you know, a, a mad plotting um, conspirator, uh, you know, who, who, who's lying and forged all these documents. Yes, yes, she forged them all, you know. <laughs> so so that, that's what happened, and you, you, you saw all of this. And, you know, I, I just thought, well, you know, I've just got to carry on telling the truth because it's much easier to tell the truth than it is to lie. Um, and they're making complete fools of themselves. Um, and this is going to unbutton. Um, so I carried on. Um, and, and, of course, it got harder and harder for Najib, and, and he struck. As you well know, he had that counter coup at the end of July um, and closed down all the investigations and soon had himself declared innocent. Um, that was, the, that was give, the nature of the government that you were dealing with. Um, and as you well know, everybody came out from the government to say I was a liar and to, um, you know, um, uh, you know, to parrot Najib's ridiculous excuse, which was that there was some barking mad billionaire royal in Saudi Arabia who'd given him the money with no strings attached. Who could believe that one? <laughs> um, but you were expected to. You were expected to, weren't you? Um, and, um, uh, of course, then uh, I was uh, sent that... Uh, just after that happened, I got that um, uh, final piece of documentation in an email that said uh, you may want to know why the AG was sacked and attached to the email were two photographs of the charge sheets that named Najib Razak, uh, the, the charges that they had attempted to bring against him and of course I published that and that's when they brought out the Interpol red notice against me. Um, so this story rolled on 
um, as is time this evening, and I know we need to leave time for questions, and there's so much I haven't talked about, so I hope you'll give me a chance to talk about some of those other things. Um, but um, what really then brought all this, you know, we had another months and months of battling this looking glass world that Malaysia had turned into, you know. Um, my, my blog had been banned, I was, you know, they were blocking me from Malaysia. We had to find so many ways to get through, which we managed generally by and large. I, 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 I pay a not insubstantial sum, thanks to all the donations I get, to be able to send my, my stories out by email to thousands of people who signed up so that they could at least get the stories by email because they couldn't get them uh, by, by logging on to Sarawak Report. Um, and come June 2016, vindication. My long, uh, set, set in motion a year before uh, by speaking to the FBI and also to the other authorities, particularly the Swiss, um, who had, I'd also given the material to. We had suddenly had that amazing press conference out of the blue in the United States. They, I, they, they tipped me off the day before in a sort of roundabout way. Um, and vindication. So now Najib not only had a few of the greatest newspapers on earth to, to say were lying, they ha he had to say that the DOJ was lying. And they had this forensic case that they had laid before the court, detailing b blow by excruciating blow the money trails um, from 1MDB through the international system with documentation provided by a series of global banks proving exactly how that 1MDB money had ended up in Najib's account. Um, I think by this stage, the idea that Najib thought he could continue to pull over, wool over the eyes of you intelligent, educated, sensible Malaysians you know, how he, he's still going on, isn't he? Still going on trying to tell you um, that he's innocent. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, that was the beginning, really, of what we saw, which was the tsunami that ended in May, May of this year. Um, it's been a very, very exciting, interesting journey, and I would never have made it without the support, the encouragement of so many Malaysians who, who told me all the time that they wanted me to keep doing what I was doing, who gave me so much warmth and support and friendship. Um, and without that, I would never have been able um, to carry on and, and complete this story. Um, and I just want to congratulate all of you on, on having stood together and stood up for right um, and uh, changed your future. Thank you.